Uh, okay, so I'm going to talk about, that's not the right slide, that's the right slide. I'm going to talk about uh, why your configuration needs a schema. Uh, a lot of the schema stuff comes later, there's a whole bunch of preamble that hopefully makes sense to people. Uh, so I'm Gareth Rushgrove, uh, Gareth R, basically on the internet. Um, and I work at Docker, obviously previously at Puppet, um, sort of, but also like wandering around this sort of configuration management community a bunch. Uh, so I'm going to talk about the proliferation of configuration file formats. Um, I'm sure there's some sort of horror slides where everyone's like, yep, that's my life. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the high cost of configuration management in a world of that sort of proliferation of, of config file formats. Um, and then eventually come on to why I think schemas might be an answer to actually f sort of minimizing the cost and improving possibility and interoperability between a bunch of the tools that we like and, and coexist. So, who hasn't used all of these last week? And a, few, a few hands, but not many of them. And, like, and whether it's XML or I, whether it's JSON and YAML, like, whether it's Java property files, like these exist all over the place. Ultimately, they're solving the same problem. They're encoding some configuration on disk for applications to read in. The problem here is basically everyone has opinions, and everyone's opinions vary, and, we, and like, we'll never get out of that hole. So whether it's people saying, like, don't use JSON, here are lots of reasons for, like, there's lots of the, and I, I could swap JSON with any of the others and find blog posts about don't use XML. Uh, we could go to Bob's talk earlier and go like, well, don't use XML. Like, there are pros and cons to all of them. There are people on the internet who will tell you to use or not use all of them. Good looking sort of passing that out. Um, on one hand, you, people will sort of spot themes within their sort of area, their domain, the, the applications they've been looking at. Um, like when did YAML appear, apparently become the standard? I think that's a bit strong word, but like, on the other hand, Flip around a little bit more on Twitter. Do, do not put YAML into Twitter search. It's, it's just, it doesn't go well. Um, it's filled with things like this, uh, often all in caps. So people have opinions. Um, some of that is that those formats, those opinions are centered around specific programming languages or specific frameworks. So the Java property files, surprisingly, well, Unsurprisingly common for Java applications, very uncommon for configuring a Ruby web application. Um, who'd have thought it? Um, and ditto with a number of the others. They sort of where they came from, what they do, um, where there are passes, where people like that sort of thing. Um, uh, the the CSON, the CoffeeScript object notation. No one outside the CoffeeScript community uses it. Uh, hook on Scala and couple of places in Ruby and nearly nowhere else. You've got these little bubbles of configuration. And they become sort of nearly the default, nearly the de facto standard within those communities. I think that's sort of, in that comment about YAML is sort of more, actually, yeah, in the things I'm doing within this community of practice, it's sort of default, wherever that might be. And again, apart from the parsing bit, I need a different parser to pass these things out. Ignoring the fact that that means there's a library or there's something in the standard library for that language or framework or whatever. To the application, ultimately, it's a data structure at the end of the day. So purely from the application's point of view, it's, like, it's just a mechanism of getting something in. It's a data structure once it's in, and then you deal with configuration. The application doesn't need to care apart from the parsing bit, and that's important, and I'll come back later to why. Um, from the operator point of view, though, all of these different formats are separate user interfaces. And that would actually sort of be fine if you manage one application. Well, because there's a single user interface to that application's configuration, and, it's, and I'm now, I am the YAML programmer. Um, the reality is most operators are definitely not running one thing, they're running many. Julian's sort of slides a moment ago, sort of picking up on that sort of theme. Um, and you're using all of them. So you have to become familiar with all the file formats, familiar with all the quirks. When, again, from the internals of the application point of view, the fact that there are these different formats is an irrelevance. Um, 
And ultimately, this is one of the reasons for higher level configuration management tools. And this is one of the reasons for CF Engine and Puppet and Chef. It's like, ah, I'm managing this, this variety of different things. They all want to be managed in various, like, right or wrong ways, but they're all different. Can I just have a tool that allows me to sort of step up, abstract my ear away from those differences and manage them in one place? The answer is yes, we've got, those, we've got some of those tools. But there are sort of, there's a cost to that. There's a cost that's been introduced by us stepping up and ultimately often that abstraction not being perfect. And I think this cost is one of the things where ultimately it sucks out a lot of the time for us as a community to do some of the things that maybe the keynotes yesterday talked about, to push forward. We get sucked into implementation details about these config file formats. And I don't think I mean, it was a, like the, having one tool to rule them all or one config file to rule them all is, is realistic or the answer. I don't think we'd be in a better place if any of those things are true. Um, but it does mean that for a lot of those tools, and for any future tool that might attempt to do these, to solve these problems in different ways, in fundamentally different ways, there's an awful lot of re like reinventing the wheel. I and mean, ultimately, everyone ends up um, with a way to manage packages, services, files, users, groups. The sort of long list of sort of like, oh, I, I wouldn't move to another tool because it, it doesn't have this. Sort of ends up in a sort of reasonably sort of set, set, fixed set of sort of operating system, like Unixy, Windows, the sort of primitives. If you look through all of the different Puppet or Chef or Ansible or sort of things, like there's a starting point that you sort of need to have. And I don't, I don't think that's actually a bad thing. Like it's just a, it's, it's a representation of the reality of the operating systems we're managing. It would be amazing if operating systems had APIs and there was sort of one of them and there were some standards. There aren't, they're different. We'll get used to it. But way worse than that bit is like literally everyone ends up with a way to manage Apache. Um, and I'm picking on Apache in particular here, but literally that could be any application, any commonly used application. We all end up, all of the tools, all the tool communities end up having to pay this cost of managing them. And that cost is non-trivial. So again, like, if there's people in the room who've worked on the Apache modules or cookbooks or anything, like, they're massively well used. They're hugely popular. It's not that the effort was wasted, it's just that we've multiplied that across loads of different things. Um, and so all of these people who've contributed to the cookbooks and the modules and like, the 300 Apache things on Ansible Galaxy like, are doing good things. But if, we would, if there'd, there'd been a little bit of planning, we probably would not have seen this much rework. Again, hindsight's a wonderful thing. I think in particular for people who spent a lot of time with maintaining the Puppet Apache module. Um, one of the things as well here, so I'm tying back to the sort of the config file formats, a big portion of that, like not the low level bits, not the packages and, file and, and sort of file servers, users, groups, things, but the applications, a big piece of that is files on disk. It, it is the YAML files, it is the XML files, it is the JSON files, it, it is the INI files, a big part of it. And luckily I have data to sort of back that accus accusation up. So uh, I did a talk uh, when I was at Puppet, uh, Puppet Conf, um, basically there's about seven and a half million lines of, of Puppet code, basically freely available and open source licensed on GitHub. So excluding forks, excluding like uh, other branches, basically. Um, and I did a bunch of analysis. Uh, I wrote SQL queries with regexes in uh, to pass out a whole bunch of Puppet code from BigQuery. Roughly about 30% of the Puppet resources were file resources. So yes, there were, I'm, like file was, I mean, file exec package. And my, my sort of assertion there is that it's probably similar for everything else. Be great to get some data, it's harder to get some data. Um, but a lot of management of, of applications, 
Apache, MySQL, Postgres, or your own web application running on some application server or running as a single self-contained binary or running in a Docker container or whatever, um, a lot of it comes down to managing files on disk. And so how, how do you, like you've got these configuration management tools, um, you've decided automation is sort of much better than people hand authoring these things. So how do you go about that? Well, option one is sort of templates. You're like, aha, um, I'm not just gonna have like all of these files because they vary based on this data, I'm gonna have templates and it'll all be great. Um, Ultimately, at that point, you've basically not, none of the benefits of your chosen configuration management tool, whichever one you've chosen, and, and you're exposed to the configuration file formats themselves. So you'll have file formats for INI files. You'll have templates for specific INI files. You'll have templates for specific JSON or YAML or whatever files. All right, templating XML is not a good thing to do, but you'll find lots of people doing it. And ultimately, you're, you need a separate templating language. So you're not using Puppet at that point, you're using Puppet and ERB. You're not using um, like Ansible at that point, you're using Ansible and Ginger or whatever templating language you want. And you're starting to spread your sort of configuration across them. At which point, how can you reason about the configuration, like the system level of everything, when you've sort of spread it across this explosion of a load of different templating files, potentially in different templating syntaxes, Templating different file formats using different templates. And your configuration management tool of choice or description language of choice at the top. You cannot reason about that in any sort of useful or mechanical way. So I think templates are sort of the worst possible option. Um, so what's better? Well, it's arguably better in some cases. Uh, sort of format specific resources. Um, so by which I mean sort of uh, something where it's actually, yeah, or this is an INI file resource, or this is a JSON file resource, or this is an XML file resource, or this is maybe the OGS sort of resources and things. Like you can now use your, to you can now use your chosen tool, you can now use, you can now encode that configuration in Chef, in Puppet, in Ansible. But the tool has no context for the application. It's literally just you're using the tool as a templating language. You're using the tool for, to structure some data, um, often in slightly forced ways. So you can, yes, you can manage an INI file without using a template in Puppet using the INI settings and, uh, resource from the INI module, and it looks like this. But you're sort of, it's, it's again, like you, there's no context there. These are just things. Um, there's a section, there's a section, there's a value, and there's a, and it's, you don't know what these things are. You have no data. Um, and you can do this in everything else, so we can jump into PowerShell and do exactly the same thing. Uh, we can jump into Ansible and do exactly the same thing. We can jump into Chef and there's resources for doing the same thing with JSON and YAML. Uh, and you see this sort of pattern emerge in all the, all the different projects. Again, we've got the same sort of, sort of primitives. Um, and I would argue this is sort of like people going, ah, templates, ah, I got bitten by that, let's have something better. Um, but it's, not, it's still not great um, because of that lack of context. Well, so option three then is sort of like application-specific resources, application-specific like bits and pieces in your like sort of custom resources in Chef or types and provides in Puppet. You get all of the power of your chosen tool. It, you, it, it's, it has context of the application. It's not just some arbitrary data structure where the implementation is bleeding through. Like INI file and JSON file and YAML file, you're still caring about the format. Um, but the problem here is invariably the, like the very high or high cost of the, the bespoke development. You're sort of getting far closer into the innards. So, and in Chef, you might have an application like this. Um, and here, it, I mean, this is, the, well, we don't know this is a YAML file or a JSON file or whatever it might be on disk. We don't need to do. It's an implementation detail of our application. The properties are first class citizens. These are specific things, not just arbitrary bits of like key value pair things. So we can reason about them. Well, actually, these ones are required. These ones are not. These ones have default values. These ones don't. We've got the power of the tooling at our disposal. 
as I said, that, like, that's, it's uncommon. It's, it's even for sort of commonly used new applications, it's uncommon. For the app you built at work, like that, and sort of my web app thing, like, it's super uncommon in my experience. So how can we lower the cost of native resources for configuration tools? Because um, I think in doing so, there's a bunch of other properties that come about that are sort of useful. So I said schemas would come back and sort of, well, what have schemas got to do with any of this? Um, so most chef cookbook science will bits or puppet things are not written by the developers of the application be managed. I and mean, there are exceptions, there are sort of notable exceptions. I know either sort of Elasticsearch folks and the Tensu folks in the public community, I'm sure there's other ones in others. Um, but most things I sort of feel happy to say are not. Um, uh, the, I work at Docker, I built the Puppet Docker module like when I was at, well, before I was at Puppet. It's a sort of good example of that sort of pattern. Uh, most configuration in those applications is totally informally specified via implementation. Um, if you're lucky and the project is sort of mature, there's documentation. But it's sort of how the documentation tracks the implementation varies somewhat as well. Is the documentation correct even if it's tracking the changes? D does the documentation represent changes to the, to the configuration API over time? Is it thought about like an API? Like an, a, a sort of an application being launched, sort of like, and they'll be like, oh, no, we have an API and we have a versioning policy, and like, we read, oh, yeah, we can't do that because we, we don't want to break backwards compatibility. The same applications will absolutely, totally, happily change config file format over like minor release versions. Um, talk to anyone who's maintained a popular cookbook or Ansible module or Puppet module if that, if that happens in the real world. So what if instead of that situation, like where every, like, I'm, I think the idea maybe some people have had was that, well, actually, oh, the solution here is that the application developers should build all this automation. The reality is the cost is very high and it's never going to happen. Um, and they're not always the best people to reason about how like, things could be configured there, and they're not the experts in the tools. But they're not doing anything, i.e. going like, oh, work it out how it's configured. Work out how, like, what my configuration file format looks like based on documentation examples in the source code is also a bit of a, uh, automation thing. What if instead applications provide a schema for their configuration? And I'll run with why that sort of gets interesting. So, stepping slightly to one side, uh, as where this is where a bunch of this sort of topic came into my head. Really, was around doing a lot of work with the Kubernetes community. So, Kubernetes has really well-defined primitives um, for its configuration. So, pods, deployment services, replication controllers. A um, whole myriad of others, as well as the sort of custom resource mechanism, has I mean, they're, they're strongly defined within the, the Go source code, in, in, but they're also exposed externally as part of the uh, basically the Open API description for Kubernetes. So Open API, uh, what was Swagger previously, is basically a, a, is a, a well a way of describing an HTTP API. It, you, can just, you describe all the objects, you describe all the, the paths, um, you describe how to go about changing them. So that, oh, that one takes delete and get and put. If you, this is the shape of the object that goes into that one. All of that is described in basically one big file. Um, OpenAPI internally uses JSON schema. So JSON schema is basically a way of describing data uh, in actually the schemas are written in JSON. Um, there's a spec. Projection schema, a sort of bunch of bits and pieces there. And one of the projects I maintain is actually extracting JSON schemas for all of the Kubernetes objects out of the open API spec. So for every for pod at every version of Kubernetes, I can say this is the shape it should be. For me, for my purposes, I'm throwing away all of the sort of the HTTP bits. I'm saying like but a pod is defined by these attributes and they should be these types. And, I, and basically, this repository has them for like a whole, well, tens of releases of Kubernetes. One thing to know about Kubernetes is that it's massive. 
One of the reasons for them taking this sort of mechanical approach is that doing it by hand would be insane. Uh, so the swagger.json file, which is the OpenAPI2 description uh, for, uh, for Kubernetes, is, is 85,000 lines of JSON. Um, I spent a surprising amount of time reading parts of that by hand, uh, which is a sad tale. Um, after extracting all of the types um, and uh, actually splitting this across a number of different versions of uh, Kubernetes, I think the last check I had like more than 26,000 files uh, uh, and more than seven, well, nearly seven and a half million. I think this is more than seven and a half million lines of uh, JSON now. This has got out of hand. Kubernetes is a huge project. Um, but having, so like, that's all coming from Kubernetes having a description of, of its API. Um, a, a description, a mechanical description of its configuration. It has a schema for this. Um, so what can we do now we can extract that out a bit? Well, one of the things I worked on a bunch of years ago was actually t native types and providers for Kubernetes generated from that uh, specification, from that open API description. The reason being, I was interested in Kubernetes, I, I was interested in a module that allowed me to manipulate it with Puppet, and I did not want to write by hand like a hundred different types and providers. And I was like, well, if I can auto generate them, then I will do this. If I can't, I'm gonna stop. Uh, and, and it's basically worked. And it's more of a proof of concept than anything else, but it worked really well. Um, there are also JSON, JSONit templates. I think someone did a lightning talk earlier on JSONit. <coughs> JSONit is basically a sort of templating language for JSON. I think someone described it as XSLT for JSON, which is sort of like nice and soundbite at least. Uh, there were a few XSLT like rumbles there. Ah. Um, but yeah, that, uh, this library, the JSONit library, is actually generated from the OpenAPI description. So it can be regenerated for different versions and is always up to date. There are ICL templates. ICL is another sort of like configuration language. It's actually really nifty. Um, I've not heard many people talking about it, but again, they have templates generated from the schemas. Um, I, I built a validation tool I talked about yesterday. So like not only are there sort of like, well, we've got some languages like Puppet and ICL and JSONit that are, now have native features for Kubernetes. Well, we've got validation tools We've got programming language clients, like the Kotlin one or the Python one. They're generated from the open API spec. And all of this comes out from the decision by the Kubernetes folks to say, my configuration has a schema. And we get, oh, we get support in multiple tools without any coordination between any of them based on that fact. Like, could we have this for any application, including one like you, you wrote internally that no one else really cares about. So stepping back into something slightly smaller, um, here is a simple example application from the internet. It's not even one, I, I, obviously I picked it for a specific reason, but really this is just a Flask application that has a config file, that's it. Um, Flask's a little uh, Python web application framework, but this could have been any Ruby application, any Java application, doesn't matter. Um, but ultimately, let's apply it to something small, more normal. So this application has a config file. Um, it looks like this. I, again, back to the people pick formats that they happen to be happy with. Uh, this, this application had gone with JSON. But that could have been I and I, it could have been YAML, it doesn't matter. It's not about this being a JSON config file. Um, this one happens to be a JSON config file has four settings, they get passed into the application, the application will use them. Nothing fancy. So let's write a JSON schema for that application config. So I'm not gonna dive too far into the details of JSON schema. Um, you can read the actual spec if you like, it's actually quite nice. Uh, you can read lots of examples and libraries on the internet, but ultimately, we can step through a few bits and pieces. And the schema itself is probably not much more than that. It's 80 lines, give or take. Um, and a lot of that can actually be generated automatically by a bunch of tools by pointing at config files as well. But we can do things like this. So we can say, there are no, no additional properties 
So that config file has four things. You can't add arbitrary stuff to that config file. Otherwise, it will be invalid according to the schema. Um, we had as well things here, like, I and mean, some of this is just metadata, but you can see th th this has a name called app, app underscore config. Um, we can also say, well, these two are required. So static URL path and database, uh, MySQL database name are required properties. So you can't have anything else. You can't, um, you, these two are required. We're sort of building up rules for our config. Uh, for each of those four properties, um, and we've given them an ID, partly just sort of implementation detail, but this is, this is a string. It even has an, we've even provided some context and description and title are not required, but how helpful is that if I know, well, yeah, that's what that's for, that's what it does. Um, you can even provide examples, or well, this would be sort of the thing that would look good. Uh, if you want that uh, suggestion schema, it can provide defaults as well, so. Um, so we've got a schema, we've got a config file for our specific application, so we, like we've written it. Well, we can now validate that. We can use, I'm here just using the sort of very basic low level JSON schema, sort of like reference implementation stuff to say, well actually, yeah, well I have a schema, I have an application config and app.json, what's up? And actually, well static URL path is not in there and it's missing it, and it's a required property, so that's failed. So that's sort of very much like raw. Like at that point, you sort of, you've written a JSON schema and you're using JSON schema tools with it. But these things are sort of standardized to such that there is a whole bunch of tools built on that you can now take advantage of. So we could actually validate, I'm worth saying, we could validate arbitrary things with JSON schema. JSON schema is not about just validating JSON. So here, it's just a data structure that I've put together in Python, that could be reading an INI file and then using JSON schema to, to uh, validate it as well. But we can do that in code with, any, with anything. Um, the JSON in JSON schema refers to the syntax of the schema rather than the thing you're validating. But we've got that, we've got that schema, and we've got our application file. Well, maybe you want actually a user interface. You want a graphical user interface for some people in your application, in some people in your organization to manage that config. You might be someone who's like, no, nope, Git and text files, that's what we use. You might be, no, that user audience actually needs a graphical user interface. Well, we can generate that from the schema. So this is just using, uh, uh, basically off the Shell React library. Um, and you can see I've put the schema in over here, and I've got the actual form totally just automatically built based on the title, based on the description. It will validate based on the prop, like required properties and the types. Um, so whenever we change the schema, well, our application, comp like we don't have to go back and recode our config GUI. I and mean, like w there, are, there are sort of, I guess, pro procedural reasons why sometimes you don't want a GUI. But one of the other reasons why, even when you do want one, you don't have one because it's like the cost and complexity of maintaining it as your config changes is greater than you can afford. Well, actually, if you just auto generate it, that's no longer true. Documentation as well. Having a machine readable schema for that config means, well, we can generate a lot of the documentation. JSON schema has, like, that in there, sort of, like I say, like examples and titles and descriptions and metadata about those things that can be exposed in this way. There's a number of tools that will generate you sort of markdown documents or nice interactive graphical sort of click around things. Um, so if, if, I mean, this is obviously a very simple schema, but actually if you had something that was more complicated, well, you could be digging down into individual parts, into, in, into the tree structure. We can also generate client code actual code in different languages to interact with our configuration. So you've got this file on disk, and in this case, it's a JSON file. But actually, maybe you want to manipulate that with your programming language of choice. You don't just want to be going hacking into it. You want a programming client to do so. Um, there's a number of different uh, tools to do this. Uh, QuickType is really nice, pretty new. Um, this will generate models like, in all sorts of different languages. So 
uh, if we take the schema that we had a moment ago, pass it through a quick type and say, ah, well, what's, what sort of, what's the types? That's just a sort of simple type sort of description. And you can see that, well, that maybe is sort of the bit where it's like, well, these are optional. Those two are not optional. Um, but we can use the same tool to generate a bunch of Go code. So we want to manipulate this, this configuration in Go. Well, actually, this will allow us to pass and, and unpass this JSON. We can say, well, there's a config file, and I can take it into Go. I can put it back. I, I can manipulate it in Go, and I can put it back out. I got all of that without having to write a load of like inane parsing and marshalling code. I just generated it from the schema. And if I'm like within Go now, I have strong types. I, like if I'm if I do something wrong in Go, like oh, I've set that that boolean value to a string. Well, I will get the error in code, not at runtime, because the config is now wrong. Quick type spots, bunch of languages, um, ma mainly hipster languages, uh, for, <coughs> for some reason. Um, there's a but that, that pattern of either generating code, or actually uh, for more dynamic languages, just not generating code, but actually just doing it dynamically. Um, exist in a whole bunch of places. So I've been doing a bunch of stuff with Python JSON schema objects. Uh, if you throw in sort of JSON schema, JSON schema objects, um, you sort of find a whole bunch of libraries in different la languages. Um, some of them are better maintained than others. It's the internet. But they, they generally all sort of approach the same problem. Um, and I'm picking Python because I like Python. But it, really, you could sort of pass this into any other language. And the important bit here is actually just the bottom four lines. Everything else is sort of just preamble. Um, here is our config. And here it is describing, I, I'm using native Python. And I'm, I'm, it's not just an arbitrary data stru structure. If I were to add arbitrary values to that, well, it won't validate. It won't be correct. It won't get past that point. It's native. It's not just a data structure. So all of that exists. Like there's, there's a load of tooling, there's sort of growing communities around saying, yeah, well, if I've got these JSON schemas, I can generate all these things. I can have documentation. I can have user interfaces. I can have pro clients in different languages that allow me to manipulate this like, with an understanding of the structure. Well, what if we could generate puppet types and chef resources and Ansible but gut works and whatnot? Um, so let's see what we can do. So I've got, where's the schema? Um, I've got that JSON schema that we mentioned. So you can see here it's, yeah, ah, yeah. 50, 50 lines of JSON, like I, a bunch of that was all generated plus then put in. Um, what else have we got here? Ah, I don't know what we should do. So this is, Proof of concept. This is not, ah, oh, there's a tool that will do this magically. Um, but actually writing it up to this point is simple because of the, everything that exists already in JSON schema. So we're talking about a bunch of like 10 line Python scripts with some templating. Um, do not look under the hood. Uh, so let's run to Chef. All this is going to do is it's going to read the JSON schema and it's going to output a Chef custom resource. Um, Let's do that with less. So we can see, well, it's, it's at config. It has these properties. And it has a path, because it's a file. Um, it has static URL, MySQL database user, show settings. It has those values we were talking about. It has the types converted into the right bits and pieces. Um, these two are required. Um, well, this one has a default value. All of that's from the schema. If we change the schema, these values change. Um, and because we're just dealing with actually, a, like we know this is a file. In this case, this is actually just a like JSON file. Uh, you could, if you if you built a tool, if you built tooling around this, you could totally spot different output formats, and and you would say, as part of the custom resource, what it was when you generated it. But yeah, we've we've generated a custom resource for Chef that will will manage that config file. If we modified the schema, well, we could generate this again. We didn't have to write that by hand. And I think that's like, so that in of itself, even if it's just within Chef, even if it's just specifically for Chef, 
and you've got this, well, I can generate some documentation as well. I can generate these things. That's quite nice. Obviously, we could generate specific documentation for, for the Chef Cookbook, or the Chef Custom Resource, rather. Um, but that would be boring if it was just that. Oops. We can do the same thing for, for Puppet. So, it, I, writing types and providers in Puppet is fun for a small number of humans. Um, <laughs> I'm one of them, it's sort of weird. Uh, but like, generating them from code is way easier. Um, like this obviously looks totally different to the Chef one, but actually encodes the same information. Well, you can see actually these are required properties. Um, it has. Yeah. We can see, well, again, it has a, a, pro a parameter of path. That's the name, name bar. We can see it has properties for <laughs> static URL type. There's some type assertion bits and pieces going on. Um, but all of this is, again, auto-generated. So we've, from our schema, we've got, we've got some proing clients if we want them. We've got documentation about, well, what's that schema looking, what's that config file looking like? We've got user interfaces if we, if we choose to use them. And we've got chef code and puppet code now. Um, and I'll do one more uh, for David. So uh, Liberal is a, a sort of a lower level, like sort of library for building configuration tools on top of that uh, David Lutikor had been hacking around on. Um, and again, it has a concept of uh, these providers. Well, here you can see we've also generated the provider for Liberal for from, again, from our schema. And we've done these things all at the same time. So there's a config file, you could totally, you, like we now have, we could generate native resources for multiple tools that they can all use. That makes it way cheaper to have those exist. And even for applications that never leave your organization or your firewall. So I'd stuck these in here in case I couldn't like, do any live demos, plus they'll be in the slides later. But you've actually seen them working. So, conclusion. I think that schemas can allow for a lot more portability and improved interoperability between tools. I think that's helpful. I also think there's the potential to, to greatly reduce amount of sort of just like undifferentiated heavy listing we do, we collectively do in all of these different communities. Um, like it requires some agreement, and the reality is, I, I think the sort of is that would there be a single generator? No, but actually, if people take that approach, like the the people in the chef community would are probably going like, your chef code was terrible. Uh, the puppet people are probably saying the same thing. But actually, having that shared, that one place to go, oh yeah, no, that's the best way of of having. Puppet code or chef code or Ansible code or whatever to manage files that are structured. And now you can have native tooling. And it all flows from that, that if we can make that one change about applications have, like configuration being described in the schema. So if you're building applications, like consider writing one. Um, I think a lot of applications I'm seeing now are actually doing this internally, especially with the sort of with interesting Go and types and other bits and pieces. Um, uh, Envoy being a great example. Uh, internally, they use JSON schema to ensure their configuration is valid. Uh, as far as I can tell, that schema is not exposed to the outside world. And it's like, ah, oh, that's brilliant, missed opportunity, do that. If you're building something new, I I'm finding JSON schemas as useful internally. I think if you can expose them, they're even more useful. Because I think as the sort of automation community, the configuration management community, like, and not just the tools that we use today. If you're building those tools to manage configs, then consider relying a lot more on auto-generation, I think in the like, medium term. Uh, or for very big things in the very short term, it's going to be a much more sort of like, palatable option. And with that, um, hopefully I've given you something to think about and I'm done. And any questions? Thank you.